Well, hello there. I'm Nina Matei, and um, my topic today for our second assignment is intentional civil and political unrest. My audience for this presentation is uh, local business leaders. So what I thought I would do is uh, come up with a PowerPoint presentation that incorporates a lot of the elements that I found both in our textbook and then also um, some other resources that I found online. Okay. So the United States Chamber of Commerce in 2016 boldly states that uh, engagement benefits everyone. It benefits families, it benefits businesses, benefits workers. And they also acknowledge that um, operations in a global environment can be a challenge. Uh, both home and abroad there's challenges. The Chamber advocates for an open flow of information, ideas, people, solutions, resulting in uh, enormous uh, humanitarian emergencies as well. So we have a couple more slides that set the stage for disasters and preparedness, threats and risks, and then we'll really delve into the pieces that touch um, business both on a domestic and an international scale. So this next slide has a lot of pretty technical information. It's got about six different sections in it, but what I'm gonna do is uh, try to describe really sort of the background of some of the motivations that, that uh, come into effect on groups and people who choose terrorism or civil unrest or political upheaval to try to get their message across. So when we're planning to ensure for the safety and security of businesses, whether it's um, here domestically or overseas, um, it's useful that we don't always just lump everybody together into one amorphous title, terrorists or jihadists or um, eco-terrorists, maybe we might call them. But I think it's also more useful if we remember that People join organizations and they join movements and causes for a variety of reasons. And in congressional testimony um, for on behalf of the S FBI in 2002, I know that's a little bit old, but Dale Watson noted that um, there's a lot of different ways that we can group terrorist organizations. And then also um, Coppola in 2011 talked about some of those same very similar groupings. So nationalistic groups. In the United States, these include groups seeking um, complete uh, independence or partial independence. A group that comes to mind is in Puerto Rico. It's called Fallon. It um, was very active in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, a lot of, um, of what Fallon looks for is they would like Puerto Rico to be independent from the United States. Some of their tactics, including bombings on the mainland of the U.S. So for business interests, what does this really mean? You know, if you were going to work in Puerto Rico, if you were going to try to open a business in Puerto Rico, if you were um, employing folks who come from Puerto Rico, I think it's valuable to understand that this is a, um, a common subset of the population. It's something that a lot of people in Puerto Rico are very aware about. Um, it's Another, it's an ideology that a lot of people in Puerto Rico support. So it's useful as a business to understand that that's, um, that that's a sentiment within the population. Also, I think another factor is, is that Puerto Rico is really kind of struggling right now with financial insolvency. They're losing out migration. People are moving from Puerto Rico to the mainland. They're losing jobs. They're losing skilled labor, and so I think that all goes into it. So when you're looking at the business climate, I think it's very important to take those sort of things into consideration as well. So on the international stage, again, we're talking about nationalistic um, movements. You know, we can look at the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization in the Middle East. Um, we can look at the Irish Republican Army that fought for so many years <clears throat> against Britain. Uh, and those also represent nationalistic groups. And although business people may not have um, 
an enormous amount of influence on those events and those movements. I think that what's really important for business to remember is, is that those movements are either historic or continuing to occur and that knowing that it's within the population that you're either serving or working with or working among um, I think is a key to, to some of that business success. Another very familiar group of folks is uh, folks with religious ties. The world is all too familiar of um, you know, religious groups who are motivated to carry out violence, including Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Hamas, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, and of course ISIS. And all of those are getting a lot of attention in the last few years. Uh, as Mr. Watson with the FBI stated in, in his testimony, an important distinction is understanding that radical jihad is comprised of people from a lot of different cultures, backgrounds, nationality, sex, tribes, and races, and that terror groups that work in support of um, Sunni goals, including Al-Qaeda, is part of that. So does it mean that um, your business interests, you know, if they're located in a Shia-dominated area, does it mean that you're completely out of harm's way? Well, not necessarily. But understanding how that Sunni and Shia conflict how those work out in particular areas I think is extremely important for businesses. And I know that this doesn't uh, affect all businesses and it may not affect many businesses here in Hernando County, but if you are doing business in the Middle East or in areas um, where there's predominant, um, where Islam is a predominant uh, religion, I think it's very important to know the difference between those different sects and the different um, branches of Islam because it gives you a better idea of folks that you're going to be working with and some of the historic conflicts and some of the, maybe the most the more recent conflicts that might arise. Um, again, it's not, um, it's not lumping people into one whole category. There's a lot of subtle differences and um, I think that history and current events all come into play with that. So another, uh, another group that we can look at are right-wing groups, and in the United States these can include um, the Aryan Nation, the World Church of the Creator, the National Alliance, neo-Nazi parties, and skinheads in other parts of the world. Um, the Oklahoma City bombing was perpetrated by right-wing folks from a right-wing group. And then uh, folks from right-wing groups um, will often espouse um, racially motivated um, rhetoric. They might um, talk about it a lot, they might not talk about it a lot, depends on which, uh, which direction they're trying to move in recruiting members. But I think it's also important to know in different parts of our nation as well as different parts of the world, some groups are more dominant than others. Um, sort of related to a right-wing event uh, has just been playing out in Oregon with the folks who took over the wildlife refuge related to grazing rights on public lands. That's been an argument that's been simmering for decades and so um, I think that that's a, a recent development that we can look at here in our country to say that these things can impact business and in fact um, some of the news reports today um, the 27th of January, we're talking about the impact that that siege had on that town in Oregon and how folks um, agreed or disagreed with those groups, but a lot of folks just wanted the siege to end and that it was having an impact on businesses and the lives of the community. So again, I think it's useful to know those things, to at least have an idea that um, these groups may be very prevalent in a particular area. Um, So along that same vein, we can also look at uh, left-wing groups, which generally um, have sort of more socialistic thoughts. Um, a lot of times it can be related to um, working against capitalism or consumerism or expansionism. And um, their actions can take all sorts of, of different shapes and forms. It can include bombings and sabotage political and social foment, outright um, violence and destruction of property. 
And some of these groups from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s include the Japanese Red Army and the Red Brigade. <coughs> Excuse me. Within sort of that left-wing uh, part of um, looking at, at terrorist categories, we can also look at single interest groups. These include Animal Liberation Front, Earth Liberation Front, Greenpeace might be grouped into that. Um, and again, actions of these groups have included everything from um, destruction of housing and resort areas to disruption of infrastructure, airline hijackings, attacks on oil facilities, attacks on embassies, bank robberies, drug trafficking, and even arms running um, in some areas. One more, um, one more group of terrorist categories is anarchists, and probably the most famous recent example is 1999, the World uh, Trade Organization in Seattle, where there was a great amount of um, protests and then a great amount of destruction as well. Uh, anarchists have also threatened to disrupt the royal wedding in 2011, and then also um, they disrupted some May Day rallies in England in 2014. One more group of folks to take a look at is lone wolves, and we're really, I think, seeing a lot of those folks in a lot of these active shooter situations and these mass shootings that we've had in this country. But then also, um, the FBI has come up with some really great um, tactics that anybody can use called run, hide, and fight. It's a different thought process that instead of cowering and covering up, people make an attempt to fight and save themselves. And uh, what we do know is that uh, from uh, Strom and his associates in 2010, they found that 40% or 35% of terrorist plots from 1999 to 2009 were planned or carried out by individuals who were lone wolves. And those were individuals who were acting alone, not on the behalf of other groups or not on the um, orders of other groups. So that's 40% of all the attacks in that 30 year period. Um, and again, uh, the cases reviewed, the uh, tips from the public played a significant role in helping to thwart quite a few of those attacks. So I tell you that to say that there's some civic, um, civic personal action that every single one of us can take. And uh, in 10 out of those plots, there was 86 plots in 10 of them, 15%, um, they were thwarted at least from the beginning by folks who spoke up and said something about it. I think also with um, this lone wolf category, folks are uh, self-radicalizing on the internet. We've heard a lot about that. And then they're traveling overseas to fight in um, jihadist movements. The government has taken a stronger and stronger stance and we're seeing more and more arrests and then um, extraditions trying to get those people to come back, trying to um, desensitize them to the jihadist uh, philosophy. And then lastly, the last group of folks is um, state-sponsored terror. And again, we can look at Libya and Syria. The State Department keeps an updated list on their website. Right now, they've got um, three different countries on the website. It's Iran, Sudan, and Syria. But in the past, it's also been North Korea, Cuba, Iraq, Libya, and South Yemen. And of course, probably the most uh, recognizable attack was uh, way back in uh, 1988 with the Pan Am bombing over Scotland that killed uh, 270 people and then really actually just recently we saw in Ukraine where uh, the Ukraine um, folks shot down the Malaysian airline and I think it was 298 people were killed on that flight. So the State Department provides a lot of good information and a lot of good updates on these particular situations. And again, if you're a business person, you're looking to do work overseas, it's really valuable to know um, where some of those really large threats are. So moving on to um, the methods and the means, and I want to go over this just sort of briefly, not spend an enormous amount of time because there's a lot of information out there. But not only um, are terrorists motivated by certain ideologies, revenge and hate and other strong emotions, but they have use of highly deadly, highly effective materials for their attacks. And by a long stretch, conventional explosives and chemicals um, outnumber all the other uses, whether it's biological or chemical weapons, radiological or nuclear. 
Um, nothing's beyond the realm of possibility, though. And um, what Coppola notes in 2011 is that uh, explosives account for 70% of all terror attacks um, that were used to either um, spread other materials or chemicals, radiological materials, biological organisms. And that's an important part to remember is that it could be a bomb, but it could also be a dispersal device. And then explosives um, can be as common as gasoline-filled containers with a, a lit rag, a Molotov cocktail. Um, and really, honestly, the planes that flew into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, those were sort of a, um, an explosive delivery device in the strangest of ways. So again, it, it's sort of thinking a little bit like a terrorist, thinking what might they do, and looking at your surroundings, wherever your business may be, um, may be located. Um, what I did want to do is talk a little bit about biological agents, and both naturally occurring and, emergence, and emerging um, infections. In the news this week is the Zika virus, which um, is really taking a heavy toll on Brazil. It's estimated that Zika may spread all the way through um, this hemisphere, uh, excepting Canada. It's carried by um, Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that also carries a lot of other bloodborne pathogens. And um, it, it, uh, Aedes aegypti doesn't live in Canada, so that would preclude it from spreading that to that way. But that's just one more example. The avian flu, which uh, spread about three or four years ago, coming out of Asia, that was an emerging uh, pathogen. The swine flu from 2009, that was another emerging pathogen. So, so but going back to, the, to that premise is that it was that astute physician who said, wow, this isn't exactly right. And again, we can all be those eyes and ears, just like we talked about the Department of Homeland Security's If You See Something, Say Something campaign. Same thing with illnesses. A lot of these illnesses look a lot like flu. Aches, pains, runny nose, fever, etc. They, they all sort of sound a little bit alike. But it's being aware and it's noticing, wow, I've got five people absent today. I had six people absent the day before. Folks really seem like it's taken them a long time to get a little bit better from this. So again, it's putting two and two together um, and being aware of your surroundings and then um, what's happening with the, the folks around you from that business perspective. Um, and so let's go ahead and we'll move on to, um, let's talk about Hernando County for a minute. And what I want to do is I want to just give you an idea of how emergency management looks at its threats and makes those assessments. This is our threat and risk assessment for Hernando County. And what you can see is that we've got um, a really pretty high likelihood of severe storms and flood, wildfire, lightning. Um, we've got a lower, um, moderate to low to almost no risk of things like tsunami and earthquake. We've got a moderate risk for sinkholes, which are a growing risk in central and western Hernando County due to the geography. Um, and then we've got some risks from uh, drought and hurricane. You can also see that uh, terrorism is really low on our list. We're a medium-sized county. We don't have a lot of landmarks. We don't have a lot of infrastructure. But the one thing that does worry emergency management is that um, we could be the host county for people fleeing from other more populated counties. Um, a lot of folks in emergency management say that we are a gas tank away from Miami. So it means that something um, really horrible could happen in Miami and people are escaping up here. Um, and we may be the recipients, we may be the host county. It happened in 1999 during the wildfire season uh, when we received a lot of folks who had to flee from, uh, flee from Volusia and the east coast of Florida. So again, our threat, index, our threat matrix helps us to determine where in different parts of the county that are at risk and how severe that risk might be and then helps us to plan uh, accordingly. Again, it's a great indicator for businesses and residents to know where you live and then what the risks are related to um, your area of the county. Again, knowing where your business might be located overseas and knowing what some of those threats and risks are, again, add to um, all of those, that business continuity. Um, and we might talk a little bit about continuity of operations a little bit later as well. So looking at terrorism in the United States and looking at some of the incidents that have happened um, in the last uh, few decades, what, um, what I want to do is talk about criminal enterprises, 
religious conviction, political ideology and influences, these internal actors. Talk a little bit about what um, Agent Watson said for the FBI in defining terrorism, the very well-defined federal uh, definition of terrorism that's used in criminal convictions. And it's really the, um, the intent to intimidate, to coerce, and to force action of governments. Um, and to affect the conduct of the government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping. Of 86 domestic terror plots between 99 and 2009, 65 of them um, involved bombs or firearms, really the great majority of them. Seven were planned with chemicals or biological, radiological, or nuclear devices or material. 14 were particularly targeted at people or groups. And then um, 18 of those plots were carried out to some degree, but 68 of them were thwarted. And that's according to the Homeland Security Newswire and then also um, Strom and his colleagues in 2010. Okay. So what does that mean for business? Well, what it really means for business is, is that you can see from these couple of two slides, business is right at the top of the target list. Um, whether we're looking at uh, international and domestic, business is right there at the top with 42% um, and then 26%. And whether we're just looking at international, um, right up there at the top, uh, this is 31%. Uh, so not saying that um, every business is going to be a target, every business everywhere is going to be a target, but it's something to really be aware of that um, more so than all these other categories, um, businesses suffer disproportionately to terror attacks, whether it's domestic or international. Okay. So again, part of that situational assessment is saying, how, th how risky is it? How threatened might my business be if I move to Latin America versus Europe. And so we can look at this slide over here and we can see that Latin America and the Caribbean um, are much more uh, threatening locations for businesses to operate. Does it mean that every business is at risk? No. Does it mean that every business every day is at risk? No. But there's a lot of activity that goes on in the Caribbean and Latin America and you can see that it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty stark difference between Latin America and the Caribbean and Europe which is the next largest. Again, it's having that situational awareness and it's taking prudent steps ahead of time to protect um, property, staff, and facilities. Again, I think the other thing with knowing about the method, which goes back to uh, those terrorist tactics we talked about earlier, is that by and large, um, bombings and then armed attacks are the most common. And so if we know what's the most common, we can do a lot more planning that way related to those. We can pinpoint our assets. We can pinpoint our financial resources to help uh, uh, protect our business from the more uh, the threats that are of a higher potential to occur because we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have unlimited finances. And you may have to pick and choose how you harden a facility or how you protect staff members. So again, it's just knowing what might be more prevalent in the area that you're operating in. The Hajj, the annual pilgrimage um, for people of Muslim faith um, to Saudi Arabia, has had a series of really tragic misfortunes over about the last 30 years. Um, in 1990, 1994, 1998, 2004, 2006, there have all been mass stampedes that have killed hundreds of people. And in fact, just, um, just here in 2015, back uh, in December, 700 people died and 800 more people were injured in a stampede um, at uh, the holy site of Mecca. So it's a really unfortunate um, situation that seems to occur again and again. The other thing that we can talk about um, quite a lot because there's just so many incidents that are happening are mass shootings. And of course, we have the events that happened in Paris and elsewhere in November and December of 2015. Um, in Paris, there was um, 130 people killed in November. And of course, in January of 2015, the attacks on Charlie Hebdo and then a couple of other retail establishments in Paris killed 17 people, having in place um, disaster behavioral first aid, mental health counseling for staff members, making sure staff understand 
the threats, the risks, the benefits of working overseas, um, and especially in, in places that we perceive as long-term safe havens. Um, but I think all of those things go into making that foundation of safety for your business abroad. Okay. And then lastly, what I would like to uh, conclude with is trusted sources. Where do you go for your information? How do you get the most up-to-date information? And how do you know that it's accurate and current? Um, the United States Chamber of Commerce has an extensive section of its website dedicated to uh, its International Affairs Division. Again, our local Chamber of Commerce, the Hernando County Chamber of Commerce, can provide some insight as well. Um, and I know that there are member uh, businesses within our Chamber of Commerce that have operations overseas and that um, have partners overseas. So I would encourage you to tap into our local resources um, where you can talk to people who have firsthand knowledge about working overseas, about the, thre the threats and the risks and the benefits. And then with the State Department, um, Back in the 1980s, they developed this Overseas Advisory Council, and its specific purpose is to assist businesses. A lot of times, businesses and business interests will contact the uh, American government abroad at the embassies. They'll ask for advice and assistance and support. And so this was developed with, um, I think it's 35 businesses back in 1988. There's a region locator, there's a county locator, so you can really literally drill right down to the county level, or to the country level, sorry, and see what the threats, the risks, the history are. The other nice thing is that there's daily situation reports, there's um, news briefs and breaking news, and then there's also a traveler's um, toolkit. And so I think that that's probably particularly useful and helpful to folks who are just venturing out into um, international business, just reaching out to new partners across the world. So uh, I would encourage you to know, go to these trusted sites that have long-term um, track records that you know the information is going to be current and accurate and up-to-date. And then uh, a few more references and resources as well. And what I would like to say in closing is that um, I hope that this presentation hasn't seemed like it's it's all um, a precursor to saying don't reach out to our international partners don't um, spread your wings and work overseas or partner overseas absolutely not um, I hope that that what the takeaway message has been is that awareness precaution preparedness response continuity operations all of those things go into um, looking at the business environment, figuring out if it's a good fit for, for your business, and then also making sure that your assets, your facilities, and your people are safe. Um, I thank you for your attention today, and I'd be glad to entertain any of your questions. Thank you so much.